produced by Victoire. Victoire gives a special thanks to the EWF, Empire Wrestling Federation, and Mr. Jesse Hernandez, as well as SoCal Wrestling TV. Find the app on Roku. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to another episode of Styling the Podcast. I am your host, Emir, along with my co-host, Rico Costantino. Rico, where are you this week? Well, this week I'm in Albuquerque, New Mexico, the home of Kirkland Air Force Base and our armed services Boy, I tell you, they they were throwing a shindig this week, and they needed the stylist touch in the ballroom. I mean, they were in their dress blues and everything. It was a big to do, yeah. so they called the stylist in, and I hesitated not. Yeah. And I was here, and it went off like nobody's business. Oh, I'm sure went off right. without a hitch. Yeah. And I just want to say thank you to our servicemen and all the armed forces for all you do for us. We really appreciate your service. So this was a non gratis um, styling tip. Admirable. And I will for our armed services. Yep. Admirable. And I will second that. Thank you so much for what you do for our country. We greatly appreciate it. We also greatly appreciate all our viewers and all our new subscribers. We're growing rapidly by the week. So thank you for that. But what would look good to us, Rico? You got to lay the smack down on that subscribe button. You gotta Don't lay. hesitate. Initiate. Let's get to clicking. Absolutely. Make sure you hit the like, share with your friends and family, and spread the news. Today, we have a very special guest with us. He is yes, another, we do. Yes, we do. He is another WWE uh, Ruthless Aggression Era alumni, TNA, NWA superstar. Ladies and gentlemen, he truly is the masterpiece. Chris Masters. That is I, also nowadays known as Sexy Jesus. Let's not oh, leave yeah. that one out. That was starting to catch on a little bit. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> sexy, sexy Jesus. And ladies and gentlemen, a couple of announcements before we jump into this gentleman. You'll see across your screen right now the brand new Style in the Podcast t-shirts. They will be available for pre-order. Get yours before Christmas. There is an email in the description of the video. If you uh, email us, tell us what you need, and we'll get that taken care of. And now also going across the screen, you'll see right there, the Master Locked, the podcast. This is a new podcast. Chris will be joining us on this network so look forward to seeing plenty more of Chris, the masterpiece, the uh, the uh, sexy Jesus, rather. Excuse well, me. Well, I mean, you could say masterpiece as well. I mean, it's a lot to say all of it, right? So yeah. pick one, you know, at a time. It's fine. Yeah. Or we'll Mr. Masters or Mr. Donis also, you know what I mean? I got many aliases. Many aliases. But uh, what I'm going to do to start the show, everybody, is even though Rico and Chris were in the same company, couple of you know ovw and wwe they never really got a chance to know each other and meet so i'm going to throw it over to rico to begin us today and start asking chris about the creation of his character back then so rico go for it my friend so chris i hey, as a rico. stylist yes. you know me i am just chomping at the bit to know how you came up with your character the masterpiece how did you do that what inspired you? Who influenced you? Well, uh, first of all, I must say congratulations to you. I have seen that you made your AEW ah. debut. So Rico is all elite, as the meme says. And okay, in terms of the masterpiece, I didn't envision any of that. What happened is, and you probably saw this a little bit in your run in OVW, is when I got to OVW, I quickly kind of realized that, like, while everybody was built, I was kind of built like I was no, I was built to the extent where I was known for it. I was quote unquote body guy, as they say, which wasn't, it wasn't my intention. I just knew that I had to build myself up because I had started over here in UPW, uh, right along with John Cena. And John Cena got a lot of attention from uh, just his build and his look initially. So, I focused on that same thing, but didn't realize that it would necessarily become such a focal point for me. So I showed up in OVW. I started realizing that. 
And then really what kind of happened is, is they changed my name to Masters from Wardetsky to Masters. So I was just Chris Masters for a minute. But then, you know, I was being recognized kind of like, you know, like, oh, what a body on this guy. Like, wow, he's like, you know, ridiculous. And so eventually I was sitting around with some of the boys out in Louisville and Matt Morgan said masterpiece. And it was like uh, the light bulb went off. It was like, you know, so I pitched that to Jim Cornette pretty much right away and we ran with it. And then, uh, you know, so that was kind of the the birth of it. And then from that point, you know, I just kind of had to start looking at um, characters like specifically um, Paul Orndorff and Rick Rude. Now, Paul Orndorff was um, suggested, I think, by Vince because I initially reminded Vince of Mr. Wonderful. But I will say that like Mr. Wonderful, I respect him as a talent. He wasn't really one of my guys. So Rick Rude was a lot more kind of what I uh, looked to. Not to say I emulated Rude so much, but just to kind of, you know, watch, you know, I was so green, you know what I mean? I was just trying to figure out like, how do I even walk to the ring? Like, how did he do it? How am I going to be different? Like I had, and I was given the full, once I debuted um, on top of all this, I was given that whole posing routine on top. So like it happened piece by piece and it was never really my intent. Like my intent wasn't to go to the gym so that I could become, you know, the next ultimate warrior or any one of those guys. Although I did love as a kid, the warrior got me watching, but um, honestly, and I've, I've said this before, I'm in podcast, my, inspiration and like my true kind of childhood hero was hpk so you know like really uh i mean you know i wasn't able to you know implement any of that stuff into as far as my creation but you know it's definitely kind of an influence for me The you know the masterpiece also had to be a cocky character so like right, you know right. I, I i have to say that it would be like you know hpk i took some from hpk rick rude paul Orndorf and try to kind of, you know, but make it my own thing, obviously. You need to, because that's how, when you take a character like that, like I did the stylist and I did the Adrian Street knockoff, you know, you would have to commit to that. And you know, as well as I know, that's not the real Rico. And anybody could read my biography and Wikipedia. No, I'm nowhere near these characters. But you take a character like you're developing what you said you took from three great wrestlers and you you internalized it and you said, I'm going to make it my own and you made it your own. And that's why as a seed, you were committed to it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. See, well, and, and like, here's the funny thing, though. I will say that, like, I haven't got to do it on the grand stage, but I'd say what I'm doing over the last couple of years, at least going out of NWA, was probably more what I intended. And by saying that, I mean, like, I didn't want to be the 280 pound guy staggering and stuff like that and not able to bump, you know, because it didn't make sense psychology wise. I wanted to be more on the athletic side and be one of those guys that could cover the ring and could sell and take good bumps. And so, like, really, I kind of got it was my ticket and I got in because of that. But it really wasn't kind of the worker I wanted to be. And another example is like I didn't want to come to the ring wearing a robe. You know, I felt like the robe thing was kind of played out i mean i did it was kind of a cape with me and the presentation was cool but like you know so like it was me and i made it mine but it wasn't really kind of what i wanted to do from like you know again i wouldn't have wore a robe or even a cape and i would have made my body the whole whole thing you know what i mean Focus. i would have wanted i would have wanted to make it more like what i'm doing now which is you know like the sexy jesus thing again not that that could be used on a grand stage because obviously it's blasphemous and people would be offended but, you know, like, this is just more because, like, you know, I'm, I'm much leaner now. And so I'm able to work in a way where I can get up and down a lot better in the mat. I can cover the ring. I don't have to, like, uh, you know, stagger for certain, uh, you know, people and stuff like that. I can actually take bumps. And so, I mean, and again, and not that there's anything wrong with that bigger build, but more of what I, I wanted to be a guy that could move around the ring real well and that type of stuff. Mm -hmm. Well, if you are that bigger guy, it kind of pigeonholes you. Exactly. Like well, you, did, know, you know, you know what I'm saying. Yeah, you just yeah. You, you you could try to do all that stuff, sure, but then you're like doing the Brian Cage thing, which just it doesn't make sense with your presentation, and you're really just kind of you're almost burying your presentation by doing a bunch of that stuff. You know what I mean? So I, it's just it's counterproductive. You know what I mean? Yeah, because I remember that was Brock, because Brock was very athletic, and I remember talks with Brock. You know, listen, you're a big guy. We got to use your strength. 
You know, you shouldn't be, you know, that shooting star press. I mean, they didn't like that, but he could do it. You know, for somebody that like, big. I always say for somebody that if you can do stuff like that and you're that much of an athlete, like sprinkle it in. You know what I mean? But don't yeah, make it sprinkle. your whole. Yeah, sprinkle like and do it in a special circumstance or whatever. Like Brock was so interesting because, my God, he was like. He was as big as you could get and as great of an athlete as you could get. Right. So it's yes. like he just falls into this class of like this mutant that I don't think. And that's why he's had so that's why he's had so much success. It's that athleticism combined with that size makes him more scary than anybody would be at that weight as just a normal dude or a bodybuilder. Oh, you me. know what I mean? Like, you know, oh, I wrestled put, him. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you know better than anybody. So, I mean, you put Brock next to a bodybuilder who's that same um, size and weight, and it's just the difference in the two guys and their movements and stuff is yeah. Yeah. so drastic. But, uh, but I will say, I will say about Brock, he was never stiff. He always took care of me. Always. Oh, really? Uh, yeah. yeah. I, I, God, I would hope so. My goodness. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> but I love wrestling Brock. It that's funny. Good. That's another guy in addition to yourself that like I've he's been backstage a couple of times when I was there, but like just I've maybe seen him less than five times in my whole life. Yeah, yeah. that's great. So what so essentially what you're saying though is like, you know, if you're a bigger guy, you've got to there's no gray area. You can't be running around doing it. It doesn't go with what you're trying to sell. So you had to redefine yourself recently by leaning out for this new character you're going to do. So with that being said, Chris, how did you adjust your style of wrestling? Did you go back to training to adjust, to move quicker? Do you, you know, no, you I, it, it, all of it kind of happened accidentally. My ex-girlfriend actually was a physical therapist, but she also was very into Olympic weightlifting. So I took up a weight, Olympic weightlifting coming off of my ACL injury, which was one of the most challenging things ever, the ACL injury and the Olympic weightlifting actually. But, um, what I found is I don't do the Olympic weightlifting. I did it for about two and a half years with her, but like it really gave me to go back kind of what we were talking about, Brock. It gave me an explosiveness that I didn't have before. You know what I mean? Like a little more umph. So, um, you know, and again, like I, it wasn't much of an adjustment because it was the way I wanted to work. And again, the difference sometimes would just be as simple as if a guy was coming to hit a rope to tackle me instead of uh, staggering and, you know, busting a pose on him. I can actually bump and we can run a, like a high spot and it's, you know, just a little more movement and, and stuff like that. Um, uh, but granted, it's great to, to not bump and just pose on somebody too in the right circumstance. But the, the whole point is like guys like Rico and myself, our main thing when you come up in a place like OVW is respecting the psychology of the match and the presentation of what these people are seeing. And you have a guy who's 290 pounds. I mean, he has to be, you have to creatively knock him on his ass and you have to do it sparingly, especially if you're a smaller guy and, and like all of that stuff. And I love it because if you are that big and you're just freely taking bumps, you know, like it's just, you're kind of looked at like a dumbass to guy. It's a guy yeah. like us. It's like, Oh, you're just wrestling like a guy who's the same size as the guy you're working essentially. Yeah. Another person they had to do that too was Batista. Remember when oh, he came? Yeah. Remember that? Oh, I didn't get to see it. You did though. You know what I mean? Oh like, man. Well, he, he got built up as the demon from the deep. Yeah. I mean, it took Cena and I a couple of times even to make him go to one knee. Yeah. You know, that's what Cornette. But was he was he anxious to take bumps or did he understand no. that he needed no. to stand? No, he, he knew. He, he, knew. he okay. listened to Cornette. He listened yeah. to him. And everybody who did listen to Cornette and Rip made it. You know, uh, but yeah, the cornet kept pouring is that you don't bump. And when you do bump, people are going to be like, oh, oh, my God, he bumped. You know, because yeah, you'll, so, you'll see some big guys who will want to do the thing. Like, here's an example. You'll have some big guys. I'm not going to name names, but you'll see them. You know, when guys take a clothesline and they can take that kind of inverted. Oh, yeah. Bump, yeah. You'll see big guys just because they can do that take that kind of bump from a guy like half his size. And and that's the type of stuff where it's just, you know, now you're just being ridiculous. You know, you're, yeah, you're that, that. yeah that's yeah, not the right yeah. mindset. You're just no. taking up. No, that's not the right guy. This is not the right time. Don't just do it. Cause you can do it. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. But then there, there is a lot of that going on now. Now we've talked yeah, about that. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. You know, yeah, they just, yeah. they, they do it just because it looks good. 
and you're throwing out the story and the psychology and it doesn't make sense. A 280 pound guy against a guy who's 190 is going to destroy him. You know, well, the, you know, the problem is, is I think most audiences will watch those matches as a performance and won't really get into it like they think it's real because mm -hmm. of the lack of all that stuff. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? Yeah. I don't know. That's just what something I thought of now, but it makes uh, perfect sense. I mean, not to say that there isn't some matches in AEW that will grab people and be like, they'll be into it. Mm -hmm. But I still think they're probably watching like performances. Cause when you have some of those high spots and stuff, you mm -hmm. know what I mean? I, that, that, <laughs> this isn't something Rico's going to want away and he just got there. But uh, yeah. anyways, I'm just saying. That's just Chris's opinion, everybody. That's no one else's opinion. That's Chris's and he's entitled to it. <laughs> but yeah, it's, you it's definitely that part out if you need to. Yeah, I could cut. No, of... you're our guest. You yeah, you say what's on your mind, bro. Um, this is your showcase. Yeah, it's your showcase. It's your. Uh, what did Vince used to say? The showcase of the immortals was WrestleMania. That was it. Um, but Chris, did they ask you to study? Like, because you reminded me a little bit when you first came out of the narcissist Lex Luger character. Lex Luther. So Lex did Luger, they? Yeah. Lex Luger. Lex Luger. Uh, yeah, Lex Luthor was Superman's nemesis. Uh, yeah, they're, they're, it's pretty close, though, right? Yeah, uh, yeah. yeah, he gets yeah. points. Yeah, you're no, you're asking, did they ask me to watch the narcissist? No, but there was a lot of comparisons to him. But like, uh, no, I don't think they did. I mean, it was really Paul Orndorff was the focal point from Vince's stand because Vince, I don't know, that was the main guy they pointed out to me. But I chose elected to also look at some Rick Rude stuff and stuff like that because. Again, I respected Paul and I liked him, but again, he just wasn't, you know, I'm just being honest. He didn't grab me as one of my guys. Rick Rude was a little more my style, you know what I mean? Like the whole, his whole swagger, his tights and, you know, just the- And the his clothes. abs. He, oh, he God, always yeah. showed his abs. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> like, you know, he just had this sleek build that was amazing. And like, actually, yeah. you know, that's like kind of like my favorite build, like, because- you know, like I, my favorite builds are like, you know, the Rocky Four, like Stallone and uh, Drago. And, you know, I feel like Rook Rook kind of, you know, those lean guys are not overly huge, huge yeah. but, you know, they're just conditioned. Yeah. It's so, it's so funny, Chris, because you say it and you became everything more than them because you got even bigger. <laughs> so it's like you went past that level, you know? Yeah. I, I just, you know, my body really responded to it and, and just got that big. You know what I mean? Again, like I don't even know if I set out to do that but i did know that like you know again coming up with john cena we had another guy named basil and they were just built so ridiculous that i, I knew that it was something i had to focus on yeah yeah, yeah. oh was... speaking about the body differences i'll give you something from my era since i built a little before you chris remember the olympias yeah, yeah. like arnold and ferrigno yeah. yeah 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 who was the guy they nicknamed the giant killer that beat Ferrigno and uh Arnold. wasn't that wasn't that Arnold's uh, buddy uh no oh not Columbo wasn't Columbo the giant killer sleek yeah. body look just like ravishing Frank Zane, Frank Zane. Uh, I'm, I'm never gonna Frank get it. Zane Frank Zane, oh, Frank oh, Zane. I okay I should have called that man I didn't I didn't act I and the funny thing is is I see his picture up in Gold's Gym Venice every day I think he's the you know he's right there in the lineup so shame on me yeah. Oh, yeah. I remember he came to Vegas. I had a, a, a brief meeting with him, you know, just, just talking. We were in Eiferman's gym. And, uh, you know, I, I, uh, I was doing something and I said, well, how do, how do I make my biceps bigger? He looked dead at me and goes, well, first you got to get biceps to make them bigger. Wow. And he turned around and walked away. Wow. Yeah. What a deal. What a deal. That's yeah. hilarious, though. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> what a, hey, you have to almost, I, hey, coming from pro wrestling, you almost got to appreciate that. Like, what a fucking. What a I heel. did. What a <laughs> yeah, he was a heel, but he was honest. I That's needed right. biceps to get the peak. Yeah. I, I mean, have, it's a total, have it's a foundation. Total, total dickhead move, but it's kind of funny, too. It's just... <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> what, what about you, Chris? Uh, who, who did you go to for bodybuilding advice? Um. Uh, you know, what's funny is I had a, um, a teacher in, in middle school. Uh, he was a health teacher slash PED teacher, but this guy was humongous. He looked like people would chant Goldberg when he would walk through the, uh, you know, walk through the school. Cause he was like bald, 
about about 280 pounds. He was only probably about like 5'10", but at 290, yeah. so he was like humongous. And so yeah. for me, I just started working out. And so like I would just – any I would stay after class and I'd always have questions for him. Yeah. Like I literally pestered this guy uh, for a whole year just kind of, you know. But I also did a lot of reading. You know, I read the – I started taking up the magazines, which, you know, for all the BS and I'm had – info you know you hear the same stuff over and over and again and you start uh internalizing it and you, you just realize oh i need a lot of protein i need this i need that yeah but um that i'd say he was the most helpful and like you know it was really awesome because i had even seen him after i'd made it in wwe and he was just so uh in awe and inspired to see one of his students actually do exactly what they had set out to you know like he like i he sounded like he had never seen that before so that's very cool for me yeah, no, very, very cool. Which could lead us into our next subject today, our men's health section, Rico. Uh, yes. We always do. Uh, important to give a little back. So you've got... Oh, three time out. It's oh. getting a little warm here in Albuquerque. Okay. <laughs> Excuse me, Chris. It's I got a... The tiger suit. Oh, my goodness. That's it. That's gotta right. go? Uh -oh. Oh, no, the, the top has to go. Ooh. All right, let's see. It's a little warm. Yeah, so Rico, well, I could not wear that thing. I would be in a full-on sweat. <laughs> <laughs> I was I starting to. It's a little under here. Yeah. Oh my goodness! <laughs> there he is, Rico. Of course, in his uh, ring-worn T-shirt, right there. Always yeah, and AEW worn too. AEW worn, yep. Yeah. AEW and WWE. You need to you need to sign that one, Rico. One day, someone can uh, can bid for it. Oh, I don't know if I could part with it. No, it's not a, but you've got plenty more. Come yes, on. of course. You got plenty more. I always have um, standbys. Yeah. So our next subject, gentlemen, yeah, about nutrition, because I want to go in this because a lot of people get it wrong. Uh, now, before we start, none of us are doctors. We don't claim to be doctors. We don't claim to be nutritionists. All right. We're just saying what we've experienced and what we understand. Um, but yeah, a lot of people say, oh, I can't do this. I can't do this. They work a regular, you know, say regular, regular hour job during the week. You guys were on the road. You guys were sl sleep deprived for the most part. So how did you figure out a diet to maintain the level of energy that you needed and to maintain the muscle mass? Because obviously if you don't eat enough, you're going to start shrinking. Uh, how did you figure out, Chris, how did you figure that? That must have been a big adjustment going from being able to eat when you wanted you know, when you were training to be a wrestler to being actually on the road, like how did you make that switch to, to dial it in? What was your a typical day like for you? Well, and this wouldn't be my advice to people like you were saying that are just working regular jobs and, you know, trying to have an introduction to this. But for me, I mean, initially I was uh, bringing Tupperware on the road, which is what you do when you're really committed. Um, that didn't last too long, but like, so essentially I would be, you know, we'd be on the road Friday, Saturday, Sunday, Monday. And so I'd bring enough Tupperware with the, uh, you know, obviously cooling packs to get me through to like Saturday. So that way, roughly half my trip, I was eating like chicken, rice and broccoli, that type of stuff, the typical mm -hmm. kind of bodybuilder type meals. Yeah. And then, um, but, you know, you start realizing how much uh, certain things uh, like on the road can be like, getting a nice meal after a show was a part of an enjoyable experience. Like for, you know, like, okay, if there's an outback or something, let's go there. Cause we know that we can eat uh, clean if we choose to, and we can, uh, you know, have a nice meal, enjoy ourselves and unwind from the show or whatever. But um, so, you know, a lot of it was just making an effort to eat at quality places. I think when you, when you could, because mm -hmm. uh, yeah. the, the unfortunate part is a lot of times, if you were on a rush, you had to get something quick. And then, you know, like you could always do the uh, burger where you ditched a bun if you're doing a low carb thing. You know what I mean? Like that was, you know, there was a while I did just uh, the protein and fat, which is kind of like a ketogenic diet, which um, I actually liked a lot. And it's something, you know, that like I'd actually like to do again. I just <laughs> cutting out the carbs doesn't seem very ideal. You know, you also have to eat a ton of fat yeah. for that to work right. Because otherwise you're just going to like you were talking about shrivel up. So, uh, and meal replacements, you know, you just, you'd have to have meal replacements obviously with you because, you know, you're not going to be able to get more than, uh, it was usually your, you, ideally you'd be able to get a breakfast somewhere nice before you head off to the road or go to the gym or whatever. 
lunch would usually be quick. It would probably be like Subway, which is why I will never, I won't even eat Subway now. I freaking hate it. Yeah. Uh, and so that's what we usually do for lunch if we're in a rush. And then again, we try to find a good place to get dinner, a uh, sit down place if we could again. And you know, that's how, uh, that's how I at least say, well, in conjunction with meal replacements, bars in between mm-hmm. shakes, if we could pick them up at the gym. Now, did you yeah. have to, did you have to educate yourself on calories? Because sometimes you could have been eating thinking you're full, but you're expanding so much energy. Did you have to actually say, okay, I have to eat 5,000 calories a day to maintain this? Did you understand that? or No, I never liked to be a person obsessive with numbers. I like, you know, like I found out relatively quickly that, you know, if I you can eat till you're full, which isn't usually ideal. It's it's ideal to eat to a point where you're not like full out of your mind. You know what I mean? It's the idea is to have smaller portion meals, but to go to what you're saying, I mean, sometimes like, you know, to go back to like OVW, for instance, when we'd come out of a four hour Rip Roger practice where we were spent and I just like, you know, I just sweat like crazy and stuff. Like I'd go to Dairy Queen and I'd eat a bunch of calories Mm because I just knew that like, okay, my body needs, you know, I'm really working hard. And like, I I run on the skinny side anyway. So I'm going to eat a really high calorie meal. So like you just, for me, it was about learning to kind of uh, read my body, but also look at like, okay, what's, I know that my metabolism run fast and I tend to kind of lose size easier. So like, if I'm very active like that, where I've uh, put in a lot of physical work, like, you know, be a little looser about the calories. Don't diet so strict because it does, it's not, you know, I just kind of shrivel up a little bit like that. So, uh, but as far as ever like adding, you know, numbers and stuff, no, I more looked at a meal in terms of like percentages. It's like, okay, how much of the pie is protein? How much is carbs and how much is uh, vegetables? You know what I mean? And like, and how do, is that going to fluctuate? Like if I was in, in ketosis, that would be a totally different split from how it would be uh, uh, normally or like right now it's going to be uh, I'm, you know, much more protein than anything and uh, not no fat, but much lower fat. And it's going right. to be more carbohydrates than uh, fat, but less than protein. So mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. that's what I'm doing now uh, to echo. Chris is uh, I'd always do Outback TGI Fridays or Applebee's. And then when I talked to the waitress, I made sure they didn't extra season the meat. You know, yeah, that's I got a lot of yeah, you, you you try to get them to get that breast not so seasoned, you know, because they really dump the sodium on that. But you know, when they when you get recognized and stuff like that, they're they are allowed they, they kind of fudge the menu for you when you're on the road, you know. And and all three of those places have great vegetables, you know, steamed vegetables, so you're not worried about grease or deep frying or batter. You know, I'm I always worried about getting the protein, even just one of their quarter pound or half pound hamburger patties, you know, yeah. and just with half the bun. Yeah. You know, I just have to say I'm with you. I just, I hate Applebee's. So that's uh, another, I put that right there with Subway where I just, unless, unless there's a sporting event, like if the Lakers are playing and it's a big game, okay, we can go. Cause I just look at Applebee's like, they're more like about their alcohol and their food is kind of secondary. At least that's how I've convinced you know, I've had their steaks before and I do not like them. But like your point about the salt is huge because I, I heard Kevin Nash talk about this on his podcast and he's right. The one big thing that, that kind of messes up, if you were to eat out all the time, the biggest problem with it, it outside of just watching the protein or fat and all that stuff, what you're doing is it's all salted incredibly. Yeah. Like if you're eating out all the time, you're taking in triple the sodium <laughs> what you would yeah. eat. Yeah, home, probably, and it bloats so. you. Yeah. Yes. So I didn't oh. know this because I went through a phase where I was eating out a ton. And so I just like when Nash said that, I was like, oh, you're so right. It's all the salt in this food. I got to yeah. like. So, See, yeah. now, breakfast, breakfasts were OK. I could go to a Denny's. I just order extra egg whites with one yolk in it, you know, an omelet. And I get the oatmeal and that would fill me up till in the afternoon. Oh, here's some advice. Here's some advice to the listeners, and you might know this too, Rico. To all the people out there, if you're going out to eat at an IHOP or something like that, and you're ordering an omelet, be sure to ask them if you care for for just shelled eggs, because they will use fillers. I, yes, I've never they will. Seen, I've never, if you order an omelet there, they say it's a three-egg omelet. I've never seen a three-egg omelet that comes out as large as that. 
So I right. had questions. Yeah. I had questions and I found out because again, we've been on the road like overseas where they will also serve you like the powdered eggs. And so like I'm very I'm very interested in whether my eggs are real every time I'm eating somewhere <laughs> else. As not to say I won't eat the fake eggs as I call them, but you know, obviously if you're going to IHOP, I would prefer to have all real shelled eggs. I don't want any of the filler, even if the omelet is smaller. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I, I, I'll tell you where not to order a three egg omelet. I'll tell you, it don't. this is where you do not order a three egg omelet. Where? Do you know what country? Zambia, Zambia. Africa. I would have never thought that. Are you kidding me? Why? No, I, I was Why? bodyguarding. I was yeah. bodyguarding, and I was with the president of Zambia, Chaluba. Okay. Yeah. And they asked me what I wanted to eat, and I said, a three-egg omelet. They oh, brought wow. it out. It was as big as the buffet tray. Wow. I said, yeah. there's not enough ketchup in Africa for me to eat this. Yeah. I they said, were just what kind trying, of eggs? They were trying to make you happy, though. That's what yeah. it was, right? You know yeah. what kind of egg it was? What was it? Three ostrich eggs. Oh, there you go. Oh, those are supposed to be real good, though, right? Yeah, uh, they're, but they're more yellow than white. Ostrich are more yellow. I yeah. like that, though, man. I would have yeah. been, been into it. Yeah. But <laughs> I didn't. I didn't even put a dent in an omelet. How, how dare you? <laughs> I know they yeah. were. They were probably. They were probably so offended, and you didn't even realize. Yeah. So, well, I walked <laughs> out there with a with a big pooch. I tried, <laughs> yeah. but never again in Zambia will I order a three egg omelet. <laughs> <laughs> sounds like a lot of a lot of good cholesterol though i will say oh yeah you know we, we hear a lot about that there's so many people that say oh, cholesterol is bad cholesterol is bad you know to a point yeah you don't want bad cholesterol but there's a certain amount you need and, and talking there's about a good men, cholesterol yeah good cholesterol you need men well, just need like it. fat too the same thing and it's the same thing with fat like we were brought up to think that fat is bad and yes, fat, one gram of fat does have nine calories as opposed to protein and carbs, which have four. Mm -hmm. But fat is also like, actually, I'll put it this way. If you were just to strip away everything, like as a human being, all you need is water, protein, and fat. You don't even yeah. need carbohydrates. So that should tell you something. You know what I mean? Yeah. And and like a lot of times when we talk about diet and certain things, or, or we talk about vegetarians, like, you know, Austin Aries talks about stuff. I just put it this way. is like in our most primitive form, what were we eating? Because mm -hmm. that's what our genetics are based on, right? Like so, and it was pretty much, we were, um, right? We were hunter-gatherers. We, yeah. we, yes. we, we killed animals and we ate meat and we ate berries and fruit, I'm sure, and yeah. vegetables on the land. So, I mean, this is just our makeup. So I just, I, that's why I always kind of defer to that when, and when we're talking about diet. Like there has to be some form of correlation to that. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah not all fat's bad you right. you need so you need fat that good fat you know saturated and unsaturated i think it's called isn't that right chris yeah but if you I and mean, if you just look at your eating in terms of that it's like what okay what do you actually need <laughs> there's a lot of things you don't actually need right uh, yeah to be taking in you know what i mean like i don't even need to be eating my granola cereal in the morning but in in my defense it does have a ton of fiber so yeah. you know yeah. what i mean and I keeps you regular in it. And I put blueberries in it and I pour it, you know, what I use for milk is I use the uh, vanilla protein. So like, you know, fiber, protein, you got blueberries in there. Like, it feels pretty yeah. good to me. Yeah. yeah. That's a pretty good well, comment. I, I know there's a health app on, you know, like Android has a health app lately. You know, I'm 63 now. So I watch what I eat, you know, because I want to stay in shape. I don't want to be you know, out of shape, but I'm not, I'm not going to be lifting like I used to, you know, there's no way, you know, the mileage that's on my body, I have to do what I can do, you know? So I, I log my meals, my water intake and all that stuff. And it tells me how many carbs, how much fat, how much sodium, how much protein I take in a day. So, but I don't eat a meal to like, Oh, that's how much it is. I just log what I eat and it tells me. Mm -hmm. And then I know whether I got to back off or do that. So yeah. I'm not calorie conscience, yeah, you know, yeah, but, yeah. you know, and, there, and there's days like uh, my cheat days. I, I got one cheat day a week. Now it's either a, a sports bar, large Guinness burger with some sweet potato fries. Or I ate for about two and a half, three hours at a sushi bar. Yeah. But that's right, my here's, cheat here, day. here's the best advice I give to people because people ask me nutritional advice all the time. Like just we're talking about normal people, civilians. 
who don't have any experience in this. And I tried again, I always like to break things down in simple terms because, you know, people don't want it overly complicated. I don't even, we're talking about calories and I don't even want to go there. I don't want to overly cal- uh, complicate like that. But I tell people, you know, if you can start with just cutting out sugar, Mm-hmm. Yeah, and, and it's not to say that that's easy, but it is simple to do. You know what I mean? You can look at what you eat in a day, and you can take out the coke with lunch. You know what I mean? And or or at least limit it. Limit your sugar. And say like, oh, no, I'm not going over 50 grams. That's a huge step you can take, and that can have yep. a dramatic effect on your body. And then like, and you can build from there. You can uh, even do more to improve your diet from there. But if you can just do that. And just stick to that for a while. Like, that's huge. And it's simple. It's, it's like yeah. simple to do. You, it, you know how long it takes to form a habit? 21 days. Right. So if they can limit their Coke intake for 21 days, it'll become a habit. Mm-hmm. You see? And then you move on to the next thing. Yeah. See, it, it's progress, not perfection. No. As long as you're moving in the right direction, little by little at your own pace. Progress, not perfection. A lot of people and, and try when, to go into something and they, they, they expect it to be perfect right away. Yeah. You can't do that. Things Your body's no, going to give you. No, and the victory is just starting to have awareness of it. Like now, yes. you know, the victory is just knowing every day, like, okay, I just had a, an orange or whatever, orange juice with 25 grams of sugar. You know now, so at least you can like be aware with each meal. And like, yes, you are going to still have sugar and mess up, but like you're aware of it and now you can make the decision now in your next couple of meals to not keep going in that, in that direction. You know yeah. what I mean? And so progress. Yeah. Progress. Progress. Yeah. Not perfect. People don't need to be so hard on themselves. As long as you're progressing in the right direction, two steps forward, maybe one step back, two steps forward, maybe one back. You I, know, I, and I you think, reward yours. You reward yourself with that. Yes. Coke, or, or if you're switching the diet Coke now, because of that, like, you know, doesn't mean you should drink diet Coke all day. Cause that's another thing. That's like, there's bad, stuff probably not but like doesn't mean you're close and yeah, yeah so like you can use it i like reward yourself or be like all right i've only had 20 grams of sugar and now i'll just have this diet coke with dinner like that's still pretty damn good you know like mm-hmm. not to say diet coke is good but again we're like you're saying we're it's not perfection it's about you know let's be realistic we're being yeah. realistic like people don't want to just drink water all day like they do want to break from that sometimes they want a beverage uh, and if we're talking about alcohol, that's a whole nother thing, though. So. Yeah. That's well, yeah. yeah. <laughs> but but yeah, but it, you custom make it to your liking, you yeah. know. As long as you're progressing, you know. Yeah. Like I said, two steps up, one step back. Yeah. Two ste- you're still gaining a step, you know. Exactly. So you got to got to look more on the positive side. There's always a silver lining around a gray cloud. Yeah. There always is, as long as you're moving in the right direction. Yeah. You and you'll moving. get there. Yeah. I think- I think some of the things that that really hampers that is the media, though. So when people see the media, they're like they see the end result. They don't see what happened in between. They're fixated right. on success. And that's one thing, you know, I think we've talked about. Yeah, it but most people just aren't even patient enough or won't develop the discipline to even do this stuff. But like I guarantee, like if you isolate this clip and you put it out there, it will be useful. And like, you know, there will be a couple of people who kind of realize I have to. But like a vast majority of people are. You know, they, that's why what is Planet Fitness has done so well, because people sign up and then they just quit. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, that's a majority of people and you can't change that. Like, you know what I mean? You can't expect everybody to prioritize that stuff. But yeah. like, you know, it is important to do. It is your health. And, yeah. you know, wrestling obviously was very helpful because it gave me another motivation. But I tell people all the time, I do when I work out now, I make sure that like when I do work out that I'm doing it for me first and not just because, oh, I'm. I'm still wrestling or anything like that. This is for me because I know I feel better, a healthy body, healthy mind, all of that stuff. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. It it has to be for you first, Chris, because I know, I mean, I've been out of wrestling 19 years, but I have a job, a police officer. Now I'm an insurance investigator. My job is very stressful. So I work out after my 12 hour shift. And when I go home, take a shower, go to bed, there's nothing on my mind. I am peaceful. I get really good REM and deep sleep because it shows because it takes it on my watch. And but I go there for me. I don't care if the guy's lifting 800 pounds. I don't need to do that no more. Mm -hmm. Who am I proving it to? But I do what my body can do. And I I do the best workout I can. Well, Because I'm a big believer in 
what you're kind of talking about too is when you work out, you get those positive endorphins. You have mm -hmm. the feeling yep. of accomplishment, but you actually physically have endorphins that are released. And, I, and I'm a big proponent of everybody needs to exert themselves physically once a day, whether it's bodybuilding, jogging, running, walking, whatever, in order to have, you need that, like, especially someone, you know, I was speaking to a friend who was very depressed the other day. And that was one of my big selling things to him again, was like, you need to do something physical. You need to start working out because you need these things clinically. You need it to, for the accomplishment of it, for the progress, like you're talking about the feeling of progressing and not being stagnant and, you know, all of that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's very, it's much needed. Perfect. It's needed on so many levels. Uh, I'm a big advocate for testosterone, having lived in the past with low testosterone. So I know that, again, working out, lifting heavy weights, um, especially for males, because, again, Chris, we go back to the primitive state of humans. You know, men were out there hunting, gathering, lifting, mate, building. And that's something. Mating. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, don't forget that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's something though that they need and, and that kept their testosterone high but now because of modern conveniences you have to simulate that and again uh, yes and you simulate that and again even yes. if you let if you're a man and you let your testosterones go rico you and i've talked about this you can suffer depression Big. yes a lack of motivation so lifting weights is a surefire way to at least help your natural hormone levels just like like say, let's say I'm burnt out. I'm working out. Because uh, Chris, do you get burnt out once in a while? Oh yeah, oh yeah. yeah. Like, just from life, though, in general, and like yeah. yeah, like to the point where, like, you know, when I take a, I remember taking a day off not too long ago, and like that, I was questioning whether I should even take a day off. I mean, I use it's a it's a fight with myself because I know physically sometimes my body needs the rest because I'm constantly doing like the bodybuilding. But at the same time, I don't get that release. So like, you know, and, you know, again, it's so, I need me, it, you know. Let me, let me tell you what I do. Maybe, maybe this will help you. Okay. When I, when my body gets too fatigued from lifting, I go to a ranch and it's got chickens, horses, dogs, and stuff like that. And I am a certified defecation relocation engineer. <laughs> what does I this scoop. mean? That means I scoop horse poop, horse poop. I clean stalls. I put shavings down for them. I feed them. I do the watering. I I just take a week off. But do you, uh, ever, but try, do you ever try to catch the chickens like Rocky style? Uh, no, I'm too old for that. I got a new hip. <laughs> That's what I we might so be I don't hard. do that. I only catch them. I I herd them into their chicken coop, and then I close the door. Then I can catch them. Yeah. I thought you were going to say when I, when I, when but, I get sick of going to the gym, I go out to a farm and I chase chickens as an alternative. <laughs> no, no. I, if I was 30 years younger, I would. But yeah. I just do manual labor. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, you know, lift lifting hay bales, you know, putting them in stacks yeah. and stuff like yeah. that. And I get the same endorphin release because it's a different type of workout. Yeah. And when I go back to work out, I am recharged to hit the weights. It's just yeah, keep no. and, and and another thing, just on that same like yoga is another thing. Like I did, I was like a yogi actually uh, quite a few years back where I took that up and would take different classes and I saw the benefits of it. I'm not still doing it now, but I'm very, you know, open in my mind to picking that back up again at some point when the time feels right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, DDP has got a real successful yoga program. You, oh my gosh, you, I know, right? Yeah, oh my God, he's done so everybody. much good for everybody. Yeah, yeah. I, 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 I like that guy. He's oh yeah, yeah, yeah. he's a uh, positively page man. That's a real yep. thing, man. Like, yeah, I, that I, is. Yeah, there's yeah. nothing but positive, positive things that come from DDP and the work he's done and stuff like that. You know. Yeah, he, he's yeah. come way. He's helped a lot of people. We had Scotty yeah. Riggs on on the channel a while back, and yeah, he, look what he did with him. Yeah, like I mean, wow you can't crap on that stuff man and then he he basically we probably got an extra few years of scott hall because of ddp honestly yep. like if you think about it we well, probably got an extra five years of scott maybe yep. and he you know and and scott really got to um despite the way it all ended you know look how scott was able to like go to the hall of fame he was able to like 
realize uh, what he meant to the business, what he meant to like my generation coming out, probably maybe even to Rico too. And, yeah, he was like, Razor Ramon to me. Yeah, yeah, like Scott Hall, like if he wasn't your favorite guy, like he was like the favorite guy you almost didn't even know you had. You know what I mean? I, I don't like he was such a big influence on me, and sometimes I don't even realize it. That's the, that's yeah. what I'm getting at. You know? Yeah. Yeah, he was definitely that generation. 95, like you said, Chris, it was Shawn Michaels, Razor Ramon, Diesel, you know, that, click. that all yeah. the, the click. It was it was a yeah. time. But um, Rico, you mentioned something about the farm there and the great outdoors, which yeah. led us into another topic right now. This is a topic. Well, look at these transitions. You guys yes. are masters. <laughs> so this this was a topic. I know, Chris, you're going to love this one. UFOs and aliens. This is something that has been in the media now extensively for at least the last decade. And it seems to me that things are really heating up in that arena. So the two of you have traveled around the country, around the world. We're going to start there with our experiences. I have an experience with some strange stuff as I, I saw as a teenager. But let's start with our guest first. Yep. Chris. Have you ever experienced or seen anything odd in the sky? Uh, well, as far as my personal experience, I know that with my mom as a kid, and she'll still bring this up, that we did at one point look up and see there were a couple of things that looked similar to the stars that would move a certain amount of distance and then stop. Yeah. And then they would do it again. And my mom still kind of refers to it. But like I was so young, I remember seeing it that like, it's hard for me to say like, oh yeah, it was that like, it was definitely suspicious, but like, I don't know, could it have been something else? But like, as far as the broader argument, whenever anybody brings this up, I always kind of look at it like if the galaxy is as big as we've been um, told and, and as vast and, you know, we're such, such a small speck throughout all of this, that it would be mind boggling for me to think that like it would be more shocking for me that we are the only things out here and like i can't even comprehend how other people just think that just kind of dismiss it like there isn't or there couldn't be it just it seems like a very arrogant and very kind of homo sapien type thing to say like oh yes we are the pinnacle it is just us because that's the way we believe and that's the way uh, everything's been told to us i don't know i just feel like there has to be other things it doesn't mean they're necessarily more intelligent than us. I mean, there could be another planet of beings that are still in the uh, the the Neanderthal. What, what is that called? Neanderthal? Yeah, yeah, yeah. How do you say it? Yeah. Neanderthal. 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 Yeah, like yeah. still in that, maybe in that stage or even, or look just completely different from us. You know what I mean? But, um, and like I, some of the arguments have been very fascinating. Like, you know, Reek, I'm sure you're going to talk a little bit of, into this being near Vegas, but there was, Area 51, and there was that guy, Rob Lazar, who was talking about um, the reverse engineering of some of the technology that they had over there, which, you know, really kind of made a lot of sense as to what they would, if there was any kind of UFO stuff going on at Area 51, what would it be? Well, yeah, they'd be trying to study it, but they'd, they'd probably be trying to figure out their technology. If it was, um, you know, we've seen some of the images of these things that can move so fast you know and, right. and direct, in ways that we can't so um i don't know i just feel like in my mind there has to be something out there like i don't know if we're going to make contact or i'm you know i'm sure maybe somebody has i don't i'm curious to hear about some of the stuff you're talking about that's been heating up in the world but uh but uh that's my piece yeah okay rika how about you well, I, I totally agree with Chris on that one. For us to even think that we're the only people in this galaxy is absurd. Mm -hmm. uh, we are not the only form of life. And yeah, there is other things out there. Whether they get here or not, I don't know. Mm -hmm. Me being in Vegas, around Nellis Air Force Base, uh, Area 51, I know Area 51 is very secured. Mm -hmm. And when I was a law enforcement officer, I started at the airport, which was called McCarran. It's now called Harry Reid. Uh, Area 51 has a set of like 737 jets. They're all white. And along the windows is a red stripe. And they come in and out, in and out constantly, day and night, transporting employees mm -hmm. to and from 
Area 51, but the windows are all shut. There's no windows open except for the captain. All the windows are shut. They leave at different times. Take people. What at size times. are the planes? What size are the planes, Rico? About seven thirty sevens, I think. Okay. Is that the that's the smaller one or is that the? Uh... That's that's not a seven forty seven with the hump on it. It's the next one down. It's yeah. a straight uh, okay. jet. Yeah, yeah. It's a straight yeah, yeah, jet, okay. and they got their own own run. They land and they go to their own area, very secured area. And they disembark. They don't disembark on the terminals. They disembark on the ground like it used to in the old ways. They get ushered off. A new crew gets ushered in under heavy guard, mm -hmm. and then they fly out. And then people do their That's shift, amazing. whatever it is. Yeah. Uh -huh. Now, as far as looking over to Area 51 on clear nights and stuff like that, you will see weird lights. But I can't say they're UFOs, mm -hmm. but there's weird formations. Uh, all of a sudden, they're there. Then they're not. You know, but you're not close enough to really see now there are people who are get as close as they can with with uh, telescopes and binoculars and they try to figure out what this uh, this is but they're quickly thwarted by uh uh special police yeah. sps that's from the air force so they're ushered out mm -hmm. probably well, debriefed if, if they have no Rico, what does it tell you that, like, I mean, they tell you that if you go past a certain point, they will shoot you, right? I, I know there is a sign of that, but nobody gets that close. They they try to, like, push the envelope. Mm -hmm. So let's say the line's here. They go right to the line and just peek over like that, and then they, they back up. Yeah. Well, once they do the peeking, the, the security police already have them in their sights. They, yeah. They've got infrared everything they know you're there from drones they've how seen is, how, is, how has nobody like done that though and just tried to run on the pot really there i'm really shocked there hasn't been some wacko that was like you know what i'm just going for it and i'm gonna run out there or maybe we just haven't heard of it and they shot these people I, down like I'm, somebody had to make well, a run for it or something there's no there's nothing out there to report so if somebody did do that and disappear it, it could happen you know, because nobody, it's a no man zone. The, there's nobody no, is supposed to be there. There's no denying, though. If you're that protected, if an area is that protected, exactly. something yes. is, is yes. going on back there. Yeah. Um, it, it That's was my point. Yeah, Bob Lazar. It was Bob Lazar, Chris. Yeah. Uh, so, Bob, what did Lazar, I say? Rob, you called him Rob. Oh, Rob. <laughs> Rob. <laughs> it was it was Bob Lazar. Yeah, he's got, uh, there's a lot of video footage about him because uh, he started speaking out on it. There's also that thing of, you know, they say when the president goes in, uh, he's got, you know, dark hair. When he comes out, he's great white. The amount of information they must divulge to him. I mean, I'm sure they do with certain presidents. In fact, there was one president, wasn't there, Rico? Uh, I'm trying. Obviously, I'm from the UK originally. There was one president who talked about believing in UFOs and aliens. I forget who it was. Um, it was, was it Reagan? Reagan? No, it was not, not Reagan because he's the one that developed the Star Wars, uh, Star Wars thing. Yeah, I figured after he heard what they had to say, he went into the Star Wars mode. <laughs> maybe, maybe that's what does after what he heard what they were. Yeah, exactly. There's there's definitely a lot. A few years ago, well, not a few years ago, over a decade ago now, I worked a little bit with uh, Bill Burns. So if you look up Bill Burns, he was in UFO Hunters, Ancient Aliens. Uh, we were going to try and develop a TV show together. Um, but Bill was telling me some, in, I mean, mind blowing stuff when they were filming, you know, I think it was between UFO hunters and ancient aliens, but he was telling me some of these experiences that they have documented. Uh, I was at the project blue book, all the secret files that they have, um, that subsequently being released now, but some of these stories are, are, you know, if that many people are telling you that they're abducted and they see these same things under a lie detector test and it's true i mean it, there's 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 something something's going on i mean i got my theories on it mine might be a little bit different from the two of you gentlemen because if you look back in all the ancient scriptures uh the bahava gita uh the indian text uh they talk about flying machines and how their ancient uh false gods you know blew each other out of the sky with weapons that would fry you in an instant I mean, we're talking 5,000. Oh. Yeah, these are ancient texts. The Bible, 
you know, our Bible, Rico, uh, that teaches that there were things that flew down from the sky, especially in the book of Ezekiel, you know, the wheel within the wheel that was spinning around and led him across the skies and he saw everything and he was so there. And of course, then, you know, biblically, uh, demons, fallen angels, you know, things like this, they come in because they're not typically what we hear is they're not really um, uh, they're a malevolent force. We never really hear of them. Oh, yeah, this alien came down and abducted me and took me on a nice trip all around the galaxy. It's always fear. And when people see yeah. these things in the sky, there's a certain level of fear that's associated with it. So I don't necessarily think these things, whatever they are, are nice per se. They're obviously something that needs to be kept undercover. But I, I want to know why in 2024, 2025 almost, we're still in the dark on this. I mean, they're still not, you know, no one's really revealing any true evidence for us. But they're, uh, you know, it's 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 crazy. Yeah, what, re what reason would they have to tell not tell us of even their, uh, you know, that we've seen something? I just have to say that I find it real interesting, Rico. You talking about the Area Fifty One uh, flights going in and out? Was there any kind of a uh, frequency to that? Did you say? Oh, you every day, every day. But like Six, once nine, a day? Or no, no, eight, nine, ten flights all through my shift. I like so you'd see him and you'd always just kind of look and you just that's the area 51 flight. Well, I you'd believe. see it coming in. It's a, a totally uh, white jet with one red stripe. That was uh, it. You you knew that was coming from area 51. And nobody else was landing when that landed. And it went on the runway, then went off the tarmac and went to the secret area. Then it went to another area. Like I said, they disembarked the old way, right off the plane, onto the tarmac, and right into a building. Uh, and once they were all disembarked. Another group came out, uh, embarked, shut the doors under guard, and that plane took off back for Area 51. Did, did you guys ever hear of the ancient cave paintings? You see these ancient cave art? Yeah. 10, yep. So again, even there, well, actually, it's interesting there. They've got depictions of what to me looks like a man wearing an astronaut helmet and a bodysuit. There are several of those. Chris... If you haven't seen that, look it up. Look up ancient artifacts with modern day technology on them. There's the thing. Well, in what you're saying makes, com I've never even thought about this. This makes yeah. complete sense that throughout history, there, and like some of these stories we've been told, there might be a correlation to, you know, beings from outer space. I mean, it, who knows how long they've been around if they have been around here. So yeah. like it just, and then like also, you know, people talk about the pyramids. I mean, I've, you know, stuff like that. Like, I'm not saying that they had anything to do with that, but I'm just saying, who knows if we haven't had uh, visitors going back back then. You know, I'm starting to believe that our technology had gotten a lot farther than we might have thought at several points throughout history, but then, you know, been wiped out and had to be kind of maybe started over again or whatever. I don't think anybody obviously got as far as we have now. But, you know, then again, I still think we can't answer for how the pyramids were built, really. So... But yeah, how do they do that with no heavy machinery? And even the Mayans, the Mayans saw and drew pictures of yep. people coming from the sky. Yeah. And that's before cell phones. Yeah. Um, before cell phones. Although, although that's a good, um, Rico, just real quick. Before you brought, I'm glad you brought that up though, Rico, because here's the thing though. Somebody brought this up to me too. Everybody has a camera phone now too. So like the thing is, is, there is a certain point here where if we don't get something, you know what I mean? Like we can't, you know, like somebody should pick up something at some point is what I'm getting at. And if, you know, we go another 10 years or something and still nobody's picked up something, you know, you it's, I'm not saying there isn't anything, but it's going to be kind of hard to argue. Like somebody should be able to get something. You know, we've never had everything a else. Yeah. They'll get everything else. Yeah. 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 Cell phones capture everything. That's why TMZ is so popular. Yeah, exactly. That's why people get in trouble all the time. <laughs> so yeah. it's, it's like, yeah, they can't. Yeah, it's a very good point, Chris. It was yeah, all we're, at a, we're at a point now where the cameras are so good that like something has to be picked up. Otherwise, we can't we can't really argue for aliens after a certain point. Like, and no. not say they're not there, but like if we're being visited, somebody's gonna pick get it on their phone, and we're gonna be able to. Okay. Okay. What system. about what about the the crops? Oh yeah, the, the crop the circles. Things, the, the crop circles. Yeah. Who makes the crop circles? None of the corn is broken. It's just bent into yeah, a something shape. Had, something had to land there, right? Yeah. Something yeah. did. 
Or okay, so it, what about what about that? I mean, how do you explain a park crop circle? You, you you, you're making me want to look this up, actually, as a, a, like a new rabbit hole to go around this because I haven't. Thought <laughs> we about could this. we could do I this look, for another hour, but yeah, yeah. No, yeah like I, I love, said, there's some I love stuff. Looking into stuff like this, oh, yeah. So, yeah. Well, look at me. I was a cop investigator. Oh, yeah. I, I like to investigate everything. Yeah. Hey, good good thing you your Vegas PD is finally taking down uh, the guys who shot Tupac. By the way, so don't mean to derail us. Oh, yeah. No, but I mean, come on. I was around at that time. Mike Tyson fight when he was at his prime right after Mike Tyson fight at Circus Circus, Tupac gets shot and nobody sees anything. Man, they Come don't even, they, they could have sealed off the Nevada state line. Like that's yeah. very easy to do. And like they could, or at least had cops there checking every car leaving yeah. and they, you know, so they were real motivated for Tupac, obviously, but you know, they should well, have been obviously. well, unless there was someone else behind the scenes that didn't want them to be too motivated. I mean, there's a lot of a lot of craps coming out this year. A lot of people are being exposed. We heard uh, the CEO, former CEO of Abercrombie and Fitch. He, he's he gone down now. Isn't he a Brit? I, I don't know if he's a Brit, man. And, and I, you know what? I, I'm a full American now, Chris. I have an American right, right. passport. <laughs> yeah. He's got his so, papers. Your accent says something different. Yeah, it says something different, but trust me, I, I, I bleed. <laughs> I bleed red, white, and blue now, Chris, and I have right, right. for many, many years. But yeah, he went down this week. He got busted for uh, sex trafficking as well, oh. um, which I get. It, you know, Chris, you live around Los Angeles. You may have you, you've never seen anything, but we hear the stories. There's the casting couch. It's been happening for decades, eons. It's been going back. You know, people were always doing that, so it's no surprise uh, that this has been going on, even in retail fashion well you know? i told you that's why i quit hollywood yeah because of the casting couch i was like no either you take me and my talent or goodbye mm -hmm. and i, I think that and the, well the p diddy thing is really the big story and i don't think anybody realized that p diddy might be the worst person in all of modern history but um he obviously was and he like you're just kind of seeing it through that guy who just went down and then there was before that uh weinstein and yeah, you're seeing where you're just seeing. I, I don't think it, I don't think you could say, Oh, it's all of Hollywood, but you will like there's a pattern here. You just have to look at people who have tremendous power over other people, mm -hmm. and there's going to be some bad actors who use that to their benefit, you know what I mean? Because yeah. not everybody has high moral values, and, and like, and they will, be, oh, I, they know they have power over you, and that they can get you to do something sexually, so they take advantage of that, but you know, I like. I, I'm very reluctant to paint like all of Hollywood with it. You know what I mean? I'm sure a lot of people knew about it, but you know, not as far as like the freak offs or, you know, you see P Diddy beating up Cassie. It's like nobody knew about like stuff like that was just so well, if people did know about that, mm -hmm. I mean, obviously the hotel knew and should have done something, but um, you know, people are horrified by that. And you know, it's yeah. it sucks that something like that had to happen, but at least these people will go down. Yeah, but it's not all of Hollywood. I know I'm not saying that. Not all of Hollywood. Mm -hmm. It yeah. just happened to be the sector I entered Hollywood in. Yeah. That 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 happened. I'm yeah. not saying all of Hollywood. There, there, is, good there Hollywood. is just a, there is just a general lack of values when you get into a business like that because it's very uh, it's uh, like doggy dog. I mean, I don't know. You know what I mean? It's scratch very, my it's back, all... I scratch yours. Yeah, doggy all of that. dog. Yeah, yeah all, of all of that. Yeah, there's but, not like a lot of room to be a good person in that. You know, even just kind of like pro wrestling, it's hard. You can't really yeah. be a good person in pro wrestling. Or if you are, and that's what you're known for, it's going to, you know, you're going to have limits to how much success you can have. You have to be willing to, you know, I'm not saying fuck somebody and I. No, dirty your hands. Have, Mm. But you you don't want to be, yeah, dirty your hands. That's a better way. Dirty your it. hands. Yeah, just yeah. dirty your hands. Yeah. Just like yeah. politics. Another yep. one, you have to get dirty in politics, man. We're seeing that from both sides now. Like I'm, I'm sick of hearing both sides. I not to. We're not obviously going to politics on this. We've had enough of it. I know everybody has, but it's just like, man, it's just, you know, and all this stuff gets dirty, man. Yeah, yeah. There, uh, on 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 politics, not going into politics. I, I don't want to go into that, but just between Kamala and Trump, um, I'm really horrified how america is treating this i yes. really am i i i don't understand it we're supposed yeah. to be the example yeah. for the world and here 
You know, I mean, I cannot tell you to your face, Chris, I do not like Kamala Harris mm -hmm. because I don't know the woman. Mm -hmm. How can I like or dislike the woman? I don't know her. I just don't agree with some of her politics. Mm -hmm. Donald Trump. Mm -hmm. I can't tell you where I like the guy or don't like the guy because I don't know him. Mm -hmm. But I agree and disagree with some of his politics. Mm -hmm. And for some person to say in their mind that it's okay to commit flat out murder because of what somebody believes in. Mm -hmm. I think that's horrifying. Yeah. That is, that is so bad for our country that you want to take a gun and end somebody's life for what they believe in. They both believe Kamala believes and Trump believes they can do what's best for their country. And they're putting themselves out there to us and saying, I can do this. I can do this. I can do this. I can do this. They should be allowed to do that. That's called freedom of speech. Mm -hmm. That's our first amendment. And yeah. for somebody to think they can go and murder a person for standing up for what they believe in. Mm -hmm. I think that's terrible. Yeah. Terrible. Not only do you kill that person, you ruin his family. You ruin loved ones. Oh, you're, and you're referencing the assassination attempts on Trump, right? Yeah. Yeah. yeah and like, here's the thing. Here's the thing about that, too, though. Um, if Trump were assassinated, that'd be the worst thing for this country ever. Yes. Because you would really put us into a place where we were closer to civil war than we've ever uh, been. And e or if even if not, at the very least, um, anybody on that side would be very distrustful of everything. Of the other. It would be even worse than yeah. what we have now. And I don't like the dialogue from the politicians on both sides at this point, because now it's gotten to the point where it's gotten very heated and only two weeks out. But I also don't like to go to what you're talking about is the supporters on both sides. You know what I mean? If they both fight. I don't know. It just gets so ugly. You know, like if you don't like Trump, like, I, you know, if you read Mick Foley did a post that, I, that was anti-Trump and like, I don't, you read the comments and it's just like, you know, people are just calling him an idiot and stuff like that. It's like, that's an example of it. And there's sides on, and there's examples on the Kamala side too. You know what I mean? See, and but, just, but but like, is that mixed opinion? Is that mixed opinion? Yeah, it's mixed opinion. Yeah. He's okay, right. he's entitled. Yeah, yes, he's exactly. entitled. And yeah. you're like, but like there's no reason to call him an idiot because no. like yeah. you know, because you believe in Trump doesn't mean that your belief is so much higher, you have such a better perception of the world than he does. You know what I mean? And that's I agree. kind of what I'm getting at is like. You know, we need to kind of all back back up a little bit, and it's okay. The whole point of Democrat and Republican is not to, like, uh, you know, treat the other side like it's the devil, you know what I mean, right. or the enemy. It's to just, you know, it's two viewpoints. We're all Americans. So, like, mm. i just hoping really what needs to happen, regardless of who wins, is, like, man, we need to just, like, realize that is we're mm. all Americans and stop, like, stop the right-left thing, you know what I mean? If If... Yeah. The right wins. The left needs to just like, OK, they win, go with it and vice versa. And, you know, you have to give up a little bit there. It doesn't mean you don't stand your ground on what you're talking about, what you're passionate about. You do. But, you know, naturally, when you lose, you give him some concessions. All right. That side wins. What is it that, you know, you're going to get out of this? And then, you know, but you fight for obviously still what you believe in. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I got, a, I got an answer. Mm -hmm. Amir, I got an answer. Okay. Chris, let's solve this whole Left, right thing right now. All right. You ready, Chris? Let's do sure. it. Chris, you ready? Sure. All right. Yeah. You get two candidates, one Republican, one Democrat. You hold an election. Democrat wins. That is your president. The loser, the Republican, becomes the vice president. There you go. Now. <laughs> oh, my now. God. Imagine. And then you make it and then you follow them together. around with cameras. <laughs> yeah, they got to work together. And who do they have to put first? Us. Yeah. I love that. Because that's why that. they are in office. Yeah. For us. Yeah. Not them. Yeah. So one wins, becomes the president. The loser becomes vice president. So cut out all this VP crap. You get your two best people on each side. Who wins? President. Second place, vice president. And they work together for right. our benefit. You know what would be the funniest For the part, American the, people. The most funny part about that is if, how heated the, uh, you know, the whole race would get. <laughs> like, you know, you imagine, imagine it getting really, really nasty. And then, you know, them having to turn around. And it just, 
I don't know. It's at the ver- I love the idea. At the very least, it sounds like the great blueprint for a good film. Yeah. Uh, you know, for yeah. Hollywood. You know, yeah. yeah so what, what what do they do in high school or grade school? Two kids get in a fight, they talk to them, and they make them go in a room and shake hands. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. Don't they, they do that? There definitely needs to be some decorum. That's for sure. Yes, it's spiraling. And, and like you said, you brought up that post earlier. I think I told you about it, Rico, uh, before we went on the air. Mick Foley, yeah. But it's like it's all this like, well, Dave Batista puts out this, so you know, and he's trash talking trump and then you know he's now uh, mick foley's trash talking the undertaker and kane just for their opinion that needs to stop too if yeah if if, if dave's entitled to his opinion right yes. then yes. so is the undertaker and so yes. Are kane. And, yes. and i think yeah, Jim- i don't i don't think the dave thing was helpful either i mean he was pointing out some things that were facts but like i don't even think that was helpful and if you look at least the undertaker and kane thing they literally just put it in wrestling terms. They didn't attack yeah. anybody. They just said, yeah. hey, hey, you're choosing this side or this side. So I don't like any of it. It's kind yeah. of ridiculous to me that now pro wrestling has such a footprint <laughs> in the, I mean, actually maybe it's a good thing. It is our thing, but like, yeah. it's just, it's kind of, it's, I mean, Donald Trump is the pro wrestling president. You yeah. know what I mean? He is very pro wrestling. So like, yeah. And I think that's hey, why. That's why they're good. He was on uh, uh, actually Hulk Hogan. We watched a very good interview with Hulk last night on the P. Was it PBD podcast? The arrangement. Yeah, I saw podcast. some of that. Yeah, yeah it, very good interview with Hulk. Um, so again, and I don't think Hulk was attacking anybody when he came on. You know, he just said what he said, what he felt within him, and and that he's was- a Trump mark. It's it's kind of funny to watch Hogan because it's you can see like Hogan's actually a Trump mark. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, I'm not saying that derogatory. I'm just saying, and he said it himself, he's a fan. He, you can yeah. tell that he really likes Trump. He's a fan of Trump. Like, yeah. you know. Yeah. Well, he's yeah. probably met Trump. Yeah, he is. Oh, yeah, oh, yeah, for sure. For sure. Okay. I mean, you know, so, WrestleMania, WrestleMania 4 and 5, I mean, they know each other. They're friends. But, yeah. like, I think Do- it just, to me, it seems like Hulk's really, like, a genuine. I've never seen Hulk, like, such a fan of somebody. And I see it with Trump. <laughs> Yeah. yeah it was a good interview though but again yeah that stuff like that's fine but when they start demonizing each other i think jim Cornette came online after kane and undertaker posted that and he made a comment like oh that's it congratulations your careers are over i was like what what the heck your careers and come on yeah you see know? like and now jim see the problem with that is too and i'm a left-leaning person but now Jim is sounding like a very extreme woke person. Like, oh, now we need to cancel you. Yeah. And like Jim Cornette's argument, I know what his argument is. It's like, oh, uh, Donald Trump doesn't respect the Constitution. He fought the uh, the election results of the last election, but still like the woke stuff, man. Like, you know, we. I don't want to, I'm not with that. We. Yeah, I'm not, you can't just can't. Yeah. Undertaker and Kane are not canceled because they sat with Trump. Like, yeah, yeah. it might turn off it's going to turn off some of their fan base. That's the decision you make when yeah. you come out like this. You're making a yeah. conscious decision, decision to possibly possibly alienate half of your fans, especially in this race, because it literally looks like it's like 50-50. Uh, yeah. You know? yeah. It's it's definitely 50-50. I saw the numbers. It's very tight. It's going to be historical, so uh, I would encourage everyone, whatever side you I'm make. Not, I'm not going to say this is who I would vote for, but just real quick, I'm just saying, if I was a betting man, I would say that uh, Trump is probably going to win this thing at this point. So just for what it's worth. Yeah. But I, I would wow. encourage everybody this year in particular. Please year, vote. Yeah. Please, please vote. Please vote. If you're eligible, please do vote. This is a very yeah. important historic vote. But I, um, there was a few years I did not vote. And the years I didn't vote, if I was unhappy, I didn't make a comment because I didn't vote. I had no right to make a comment because I didn't exercise my right to vote, but I voted the last three. So I feel I'm entitled to my opinion now because I participated. If you don't vote. Nevada Nevada matters too, right? Nevada is not a battleground state though. Is it? No, no. I, um, I don't know what Nevada is. They're saying it could, the, the, well, that's what the news said this morning that it could go blue. I don't see how that, because, you know, Nevada, yeah, I was mm. surprised. But I mean, so, well, northern Nevada, I could see. Yeah, southern Nevada, I think, is all red. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but northern it, Nevada is different. It, it's you wouldn't believe it's the same state. 
Really? From northern Nevada to southern Nevada. Okay. Yeah. Totally it's different. Gonna be, it's going to be interesting. That's all I can say. We got another, what, almost two weeks, you said, Chris? November the 5th coming up hot and heavy. So we'll encourage people uh, again to get out and vote. Also, I want to do a little quick announcement, Rico. So WrestleCon 25, oh. Las Vegas, Nevada. So another uh, member of our Victoire podcast team, Mr. Paul Roma and Mario Mancini have uh, procured tables at the event. Of course, Rico, you live there. So uh, you will see us all there. WrestleCon 2025. I'm going to be conducting interviews with fans, getting it on camera. Going to be merchandise, uh, autographs, photo photographs, you name it. So make sure you punch your ticket for WrestleCon. Chris, will you be there in 2025? I haven't made plans for it yet, but I'm assuming I probably will. But, okay. they'll, you know, they'll be, you know, we'll find out here in the next few months. Okay, yeah, wonderful. with the master lock. Yep, master with master locked. Yeah. Oh yeah, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. See, we oh. might have to promote. Yes, with master. Put some, lock. put some people in master locks. Yeah, put them in the master locks. There you go. You want a master lock? Twenty bucks. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, give me a Jackson. Yeah, there you go. There, Fifty bucks. You laugh, you laugh about it, but man, I've made a lot of money putting master locks on fans. Holy yeah. Cow. <laughs> Holy cow. They, they love that stuff. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. Hey, I, I don't I don't get too many requests for the spin kick though. No. <laughs> <laughs> That's the great thing about that full Nelson finish, man. It's something you can do, you know, like yeah. it's for a photo so easy. Yeah. Chris, <laughs> are you gonna are you gonna be anywhere in the next couple of weeks you want to talk about? Uh oh my gosh, you're putting me on the spot. Uh I am somewhere this weekend. I can't tell you off the top of my head. It's somewhere uh, out in the east, but I am uh, Working out here November 3rd for a synagogue, actually, for this uh, Jewish wrestling promotion. So that'll be fun. Oh, you're invited, by the way, because I know you're a local guy. It's November 3rd. And then, uh, oh, Dungeon Wrestling out in Calgary on December 10th. And, you know, I do have something in Georgia the day before that. But uh, or I don't know off the top of my head the info on that one, though. But Dungeon Wrestling, wrestling, uh, 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 what's his name, Ginger for the, for the title. Yeah, Ginger for the Hall. Dungeon, uh, for the Stu Hart title. So that'll be a uh, big thing. Yeah, that's going to be good. Yeah, we look forward to that. Well, Lefty, well, we'll talk off camera. Uh, I'll get the information for that show that you're talking about uh, November 3rd. That's going to be great. Um, but gentlemen, it looks like we've come to the end of this show right here. Of course, uh, fans, we want to thank you for joining us on this episode of Style in the Podcast. We want to thank our special guest, masterpiece thank you thank Sexy you G Sexy thank Jesus. you chris for coming on <laughs> thank you Thanks, so guys. much oh, a great time great time with you guys yeah, yeah. yeah it's been wonderful this i had an absolute blast yeah it was a great talk great talk there's gonna, there's gonna be plenty more enrico to to send us out and by the way chris stay on the line before we before we cut off completely but rico to send us out tell everybody your very inspirational quote we'll we'll end up that listen everybody this is how I live my life. This is how I've accomplished things. And it's if it's what your mind can conceive, your heart can achieve. So everything is within your grasp. Amen. Thank you Love so that. much, Rika. Thank you so much. All right, ladies and gentlemen, we'll see you next week. And joining us, one of the American Gladiators, Lori. And she she was ice on American Gladiator. So she Ice, be, ice, baby. She will be at, with <laughs> us here next week on Stalin. But until then, everybody, take care. Don't forget to hit that subscribe button. Thank you, Rika.